We've been looking into a study for the last many, many weeks now, about a dozen weeks or so. Uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We were talking about the basic rules of Christian living. Uh, we're answering questions a lot of people have asked me over the years about issues like dating and marriage and uh, uh, rules of etiquette and uh, moral uh, moral etiquette. <sighs> you know, I, I read something online the other day. A fella had written about, you know, one of the problems he had with churches is that churches, you know, they get to the point where they try to micromanage your sex life and blah, blah, blah. And I thought to myself, well, you know, no, they're not trying to micromanage your yeah. sex life, but what what we do try to do because the scriptures advise us on these issues and if the scriptures advise us on these issues then obviously these are issues where we need direction we need guidance we need a little help making sure we approach things from a moral perspective a godly perspective and in a nutshell we we discovered that a basic rule of thumb for christian living is very simple uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, that's pretty simple. You know, it's pretty easy. And uh, we do not visit harm upon our neighbor emotionally, psychologically, physically, spiritually, or financially. If you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll notice those are... Uh, those are the areas that the commandments cover when it comes to human interaction with human beings. The reason we do not commit adultery is it is we are visiting damage upon our neighbor emotionally, we are visiting damage upon our neighbor's relationship, and we have no business doing that. And if we don't want somebody interfering with our relationships and becoming a third wheel and, and clogging up the works, because all relationships go through hard times. All relationships go through tough times. And it's during those tough times, a lot of times, people go outside of their relationship, uh, seeking something they're not getting internally, and then they gum up the works, and now they've complicated things. And now, working out, the initial issue is that much harder because you've got a third party involved. So no, the church, at least this church, this pastor, is not interested in micromanaging anybody's sex life. Uh, but I do want to give biblical, godly counsel as to uh, how God would have us to live and how the Lord would have us to conduct ourselves. All right. So now we have gotten to the place where we're looking at the issue of liberty which is the final leg of our journey. If I can get that thing to move forward one. Okay, let me see. I just love... Technology. Yeah, yeah, it's so much fun. This mouse just doesn't... There we go. Hopefully that will do it. There we go. We're looking at the issue of liberty as it relates to Christian living because there is a tendency within what I refer to as hyper-liberal churches. That's where you take liberty to an extreme, to a, to a gross extreme. Anything goes, you can do whatever you want to do, it don't matter, God's good with all of it because... You know, we preach that God understands you and he, and he understands what makes you tick. And He understands who you are and I believe all of those things. And then they go the next step. And therefore, you can just be you and do whatever you want to do and God's okay with it because after all, He gets you and He understands you. No, the Lord does get you. He does understand you. But He also offers us wisdom. He also offers us direction. Just like any parent seeks to impart unto their children uh, direction and guidance based on wisdom. And uh, you want your child to have the best life. Well, I've got news for you. God wants you to have your best life. 
And your best life, you may think your best life is dropping into bed with everything that has legs and, you know, drinking and partying and getting drunk and doing all these things. Um, but you'd be shocked how many people have lived that life who'd be able to tell you that that really is not the best life. I've got an uncle who lived as an alcoholic for, good Lord, probably 30 years of his life or better. Finally, he, he didn't realize that we had been praying for him for years that God would deliver him. And finally, uh, Aunt Dorothy and I went up to the front of the church at Riverside Church of God and we asked Brother Gillum to pray with us about my uncle and that God would deliver him from alcohol. Well, it wasn't a couple months later after that prayer that day that one of my uncle's friends bet him I'm telling you, God, it's amazing how God works. One of my uncle's friends bet him that he could not stop drinking for, I think it was like six months, and he bet him a large sum of money. It was a good amount of money. Well, if you knew my uncle, anything over $100 is a large <laughs> sum of money. But this was somewhere in the neighborhood like $1,000, $2,000, something like that. And the man, he was making a legitimate bet. My uncle had been twice divorced. His wife's hated him because he was abusive and nasty. When he was drunk, his children wanted nothing to do with him. He had four daughters. They don't want anything to do with him because he was a drunk, nasty old drunk, you know. And so he took up his friend on the bed. He went six months or a year, whatever it was, without drinking. He told me, he said, Chuck, by the time I finished that period of time, he said, I could not believe how clear-headed I was. I could not believe how in control of myself and how in control of my own life I was. I could not believe how I was able to get up and go to work and I didn't have hangovers and I wasn't feeling sick. And he said, my life improved a thousand percent simply by laying down the bottle. He said, I decided when I collected my money from my friend, he said, I decided that I was never again going to touch alcohol. And that's been literally uh, 30, almost 35 years ago. So folks, what you think is your best life. I, you know, I see on Facebook all the time, people just drinking it up, you know, Martin clubbing. We've all been there at some point in our life. Most of us have been there. If we've ever been out of church at least. I was out of church for a few years. I did the club kid thing. I did all that. I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing. I'm not going to stand here and say, you know, you're headed to hell in a handbasket simply because you do or have done these things. But what I am telling you is what you think is such a blast and what you think is so wonderful and great really is not nearly as wonderful and great as you might think it is. Tommy and I met back in 2001, and I hated clubs and bars from the word go. I never did like them. Well, he liked to go, and he liked to dance, and he liked, you know, to, to hang out and be with friends and all that stuff. And I, So I, I don't believe in trying to be a dictator about anything. I really don't. And so I said, all right, well, you know, I'll try to work with him, and I'll go with him. And I did. I went with him. I'd go to the pool table with our movie. I'd go to the, and I'd play pool the whole time we were there because that's what I enjoy. I like playing pool. I didn't care about dancing. I didn't care about all that other garbage. I just would play pool. But I still didn't like being there. I didn't like the atmosphere. I don't, I don't like what's going on around me, you know, the way some people act when they get drunk and stupid, you know. And so anyway, as time went on over the course of months and the first couple of years, we gradually kind of began to wean away from that. Now we have been in probably a decade or better, well, probably well over a decade, and yet he and I have sat and talked about it and said, hasn't God blessed us? Don't we have a great life? We've been able to do some wonderful things. We've been able to go some wonderful places. We, you know, at as much of a struggle as this church has been, God has blessed me with friends who actually care about me and care about my health and my well-being. And one of my friends happens to be a fairly well-to-do gentleman. 
And, you know, every once in a while he'd say, hey, I'm going to send you some money. You need to take care of you. You've been pastoring all these years without collecting a nickel, without getting a single penny for anything you do. said, why don't you go on a cruise? Why don't you go do something? Take a vacation. And when he does this, we take advantage of it because that, we don't know when the next time we're going to be able to do such a thing is going to come along. So, but he and I have talked about it and said, you know, we have such a wonderful life. God's blessed us with a beautiful home. We both have cars to drive. You know, I mean, Martin, it's not the Taj Mahal. We don't live in a mansion. We don't drive uh, Lincoln, you know, whatever. But we have a good life. And I enjoy every minute of it. I enjoy the simple things. I, and then the Lord's blessed us with us being able to get this land. And You know, I mean, God just has a way of working things out. I like my life today a thousand times better than going to clubs and going to bars and drinking up my money and finding a one-night stand is going to break my heart tomorrow and constantly being disappointed and constantly being heartbroken and constantly being lonely. And, you know, the problem is you've got a bunch of people out there, and I'm talking about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You've got a bunch of people out there, Martin, who want the... The relationship and they want the love affair and they want the uh, passion and the romance but they also want to still be going to the clubs and going to the bars I got news for you those things are counterproductive that's right those things are counterproductive you and then you wonder why you, you know every time you try oh, everybody I get with always cheating on me well stupid why do you keep going to the market Why do you keep going where all the pretty boys are, where all the people are who are advertising their goods because they're as loose as a goose and they'll give it away. They don't care you're married. They don't care you're in a relationship. They don't care you're committed. They don't care at all. I just had somebody today contact me on Facebook. Me, of all people, trying to chat me up, asking me for my phone number so he can give me. I said, honey, I don't need your phone calls. I don't need your calls at all. I'm not, I'm not interested. Thank you very much. But Martin, if you keep going, where everybody's selling their goods, if you or your partner, either one, has the slightest bit of weakness, all you're doing is putting temptation in front of your eyes, you know, every minute. And you got enough, I'm going to talk plain because I've told you a million times it's the only way I know how to talk. There's enough slut puppies out there will be more than happy to satisfy your partner, your spouse's fantasies, okay? Yeah, that's right. And the devil, if you think the devil ain't going to try to do everything in his power to, to divide your relationship and cause you, say, well, I got news for you. The Bible tells us that it's better if two walk agreed. Right. Now listen, if the Bible tells us it's better for two to walk agreed. It doesn't say anything about gender. Don't you think the devil knows that? Don't you think the enemy is going to work against any fashion, any kind of coupling, any kind of union between two human beings? I'm going to tell you a little secret. Satan hates relationships. Satan hates marriages. Satan hates friendship. When you see an individual who begins to be vexed by demonic spirits, do you know what one of the first things that will happen? That person will start pushing their friends away. They'll start pushing their family away. They'll start isolating themselves. Because Satan knows that the most vulnerable human being is a human being who has no connections, who is not connected to others. Even in the medical profession, you go to the hospital nowadays for surgery or for treatment of some guy, and one of the first questions I'll ask you is, do you have a good support system? Right. Do you have family? Do you have friends? Do you have a partner? Do you have a wife, a husband? You see, because the Word of God, in its divine wisdom, says it's better that two walk agreed. Because if one fall, the other can lift him up. Two can keep each other warm. You know, there are benefits to more than one. 
And the enemy is going to work against your relationship. So again, I say, if you're in a relationship and you're going out to the clubs and the bars, all you're doing is giving the enemy all the opportunity in the world to divide you. And if you had any sense as a child of God, you would know you ought not to be doing that. <laughs> Amen. All right. We've been talking in recent weeks. We have begun to look at... I need to find the reference here real quick. Galatians, the... Uh, I believe it's Galatians 1. Let me get it up here if I can. There we go. No, I must have left that passage out. Anyway, okay. Anyway, it's the entire chapter. And let me go here a minute. All right. Okay. Actually, it's Galatians 5, the entire chapter. I, I went and put verses 1 through 26, the entire chapter, but I failed... To mark which chapter it was. And we've been looking at this. And I don't believe I have quite finished it. Let's go down to. Alright. Let's start at verse 6. For in, in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but faith which worketh by love. We were talking uh, a week ago, this past uh, Wednesday, or a week ago, the last Wednesday we were together, last Wednesday was the 4th of July, so we didn't have Bible study. We were talking about Paul was trying to address the issue of the law and how that if you, if you even begin to try to embrace one point of the law for the sake of the law, you become indebted to the entire law. And he's using circumcision as an example because in the early Christian church there were Jewish believers who were trying to convince the Gentile non-Jewish believers that they still needed to be circumcised. That that, you know, yes, you know, you're a Christian and, and, and you, you're not obligated to the law, but... Circumcision is one thing you still must follow. Well, guess what? Paul said, no, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision. So he said, now you've got to remember, Paul was a Pharisee. If there was anybody on the planet who had an understanding <laughs> and a training in the law of Moses, it was, it was Paul. And if there was to be a commitment or a loyalty to any point of the law, circumcision would be that point. And yet here is the Apostle Paul saying, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything. He goes on to say, ye did run well, meaning, You've been doing well. You know, you've been going along well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Aha. The truth. Well, didn't Jesus say you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free? So Paul is saying anytime you get caught up in anything that pulls you back into bondage, you're no longer obedient to the truth. Because the truth does what liberates. Religion binds. The law binds. Paul said in verse 8, This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. 
In other words, again, uh, you've been convinced of this, but not by God. There's a lot of stuff people believe in churches. There's a lot of stuff people are convinced of, Martin, in the church that they're fully convinced of it, but it's not of God. It's not God that convinced them. They may have been convinced by men, but not the one that calls them. The one who calls them is God. A little leaveneth, leaveneth the whole lump. You don't have to put four cups of yeast into a, uh, into a loaf of, of uh, bread dough to make that bread dough rise. No. All you need is a little tiny bit of yeast. And boy, that bread dough will rise. You need it. It'll rise again. You need it. It'll rise again. Paul said, it doesn't take a whole lot of untruth to bring you right back into bondage. It doesn't take a whole lot of untruth. It doesn't take a whole lot of law to ruin you. It doesn't take a whole lot of religion to ruin you. It doesn't take a whole lot of rules to ruin you. He said, I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. So again, Paul is saying, I have confidence in God that y'all are going to get your head on straight and you're going to understand this thing right he said, and that guy who's causing you all this grief, bringing this teaching in, that you must be circumcised, he said, he's going to stand before God and answer for this in the judgment. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? He says, guys, I'm persecuted by the Jews all the time. Why would you even let this issue of circumcision bother you? He said, if I were teaching circumcision, do you think I'd be persecuted the way I'm persecuted? Obviously not. Well, if I'm not teaching it, and y'all are supposed to be following what I'm teaching you, why are you letting this other person bring trouble to you? For brethren, ye have been called unto, the magic word, liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to serve, but by love, serve one another. So Paul said, now don't use this liberty, the concept of liberty, to just go out there and do whatever suits you. This is where we understand you can't just do whatever you feel like doing and everything's good. No. Paul said, do not use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, to satisfy your flesh. And say, oh, well, you know, I'm free in Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I can do whatever I want to do. But then Paul said, but by love serve one another. You remember what we talked about when we were saying there's a lot of things we don't do because we're mindful of one another? Right. See, this is falling back on that principle. But by love, serve one another. Be mindful of those around you. I realize that I have liberty today. For instance, I can drink wine. I can drink alcohol. But I don't. Why do I not? Because I'm going to go to hell if I do? No. Because I'm unholy if I do? Because you know I'm unclean if I do? No. I don't because there are too many people in our world today who can't. And I don't want them to falsely see me able to do so with moderation and have them say, well, bless God, if Brother Charles can drink in moderation, why can't I? And then boom, one drink, and boom, they're right back off the wagon. They're right back in a life of alcoholism. They're bound again by that addiction. So as a way of helping my weaker uh, brethren, I avoid it entirely. And that I, it doesn't kill me to live like that, doesn't bother me to live like that one iota. He said, for the, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Whoops, I actually, I skipped a couple of verses. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
For brethren, ye have been called unto, the, uh, unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Again, do you see how in the beginning of our study, this was the primary principle that we were taught. This is one of the primary uh, principles that God wants believers to walk in. Love your neighbor as yourself. Treat people the way you desire to be treated. And Paul, again, is hearkening back to this, but he's hearkening back to this in talking about what? Liberty. He's saying, but your liberty should still be moderated by what? By your love one for another. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed of one another, uh, one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Say, well, pastor, why did you repeat that three times? Um, because it doesn't say the things that ye should. Ah! Should would be a mandate. Should would be you have to. This is what you should be doing. That's not what Paul said. He said, no, the things that you would. Why? Because you're walking in liberty. Therefore, it's not an issue of you must do this or you must not do this. It's an issue of you have made a choice and a decision to do this. So you made a choice and a decision to do the right thing. And Paul said, don't walk after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. Because the minute you give the flesh any opportunity, you're going to start doing things that you otherwise would would not do. You're going to go against the spiritual principles that you're striving to live by. So you want to retain control. You want to stay in control. That's what the word meekness means. One of the gifts of the Spirit is meekness, self-control. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit, self-control. Well, self-control means that I do what I want to do. Nothing controls me. I do what I want to do. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's liberty. Self-control is liberty. Because you're not controlled by addiction. You're not controlled by sexual addiction. You're not controlled by alcohol addiction. You're not controlled by drug addiction. No, you are fully in control of your own self. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. And this is why Paul said, if you give in to the flesh and you let the flesh start telling you what to do and how to do it, then you're forfeiting your self-control and you start doing things that you otherwise would not do. Pretty simple, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Not nearly as scary when you look at it from a biblical perspective. <laughs> then he goes on to say, verse 18, chapter 5, Galatians. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. If the Spirit of God is leading you, you're not under the law. So it's not about rules, it's not about regulations, it's not about dogma, it's not about dictates. Now listen, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? He said, these are things that come naturally to the flesh. Adultery. Fornication. Notice those two things are listed separately. Remember earlier in our study, I told you, adultery does not fall under the classification of fornication. No, it's a whole separate act. It's a whole separate thing. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, 
idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. God's people don't behave like this. These are things that come naturally to the flesh. In order to experience these things, in order to see these things, you've got to be living entirely, completely according to the mandate of your flesh. You've got to be letting your flesh dictate what you do and how you do it. And if you do, if you just let your flesh have its own way, any one or all of these things are going to manifest themselves. They're natural to the flesh. These are natural to our human existence, okay? But then look at how Paul continues. He said, but, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. The fruit of the Spirit. I've talked about this in the past over the years. The fruit of the... If you're led by the Spirit of God, Martin, these things will manifest themselves. Fruit of the Spirit is not something you have to strive for to demonstrate or you have to strive to manifest no a fruit tree doesn't struggle to produce fruit an apple tree does not stand there and go I'm an apple tree I'm supposed to produce apples and try to produce an apple but we've got so-called Christians <coughs> who run around well I've got to try to be, act gentle. I've got to try to act meek. I've got to try to exercise self-control. I've got to try to show love. I've got to try to show gentleness. I've got to try to have peace and joy. I've got to try to strive for these things because after all, these are the things you'll see in the life of a child of God. No, these are things you'll see in the life of a child of God who is led by the Spirit. And these things will naturally occur. They're fruit. Do you follow the principle? It's fruit. It's fruit. You don't have to work at it. All you have to do to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life is follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. All you've got to do is let the Spirit of the Lord lead you, and you will find you've got peace. You will find you've got joy. You will find you've got self-control. You will find you've got love. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So the idea here is Paul is not listing things that we must struggle to try to achieve. No. He's saying if you're doing things right, these things will be there. So if I find that something that ought to be in the life of a believer who's walking after the Spirit is missing in my life, what I need to do is say, Lord, help me. What am I missing? What am I missing? What, what am I doing wrong? What, where am I not following you that this particular fruit is missing in my life? I've got apples, I've got oranges, I've got bananas, I've got pears, I've got peaches, but Lord, I don't seem to have any kumquats. Do you follow what I'm saying? The issue is not, oh, I've got to try to somehow or another make it appear as though this is in my life. No, 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 no. This is what we have in the church world today. We have a church world full of people who look at the list of the fruits of the Spirit, and then Martin, they go out of their way to try to create the appearance of these things in their lives.
They're not born again. They're not truly a born again believer. Not at all. Not at all. There's somebody who is trying to make it appear as though they have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, so on and so forth. Do you follow what I'm saying? No. If you're a child of God, you've been born again, you're following the leading of the Lord, you're following the leading of the Spirit, these things will simply manifest, just like fruit on a tree. As long as the tree is what? It is going to produce fruit. Healthy. So what then is our job as a, believe, as a child of God and as a believer? To remain healthy. <laughs> our job is to walk with the Lord and to try to remain spiritually healthy. It's that simple. I preached a message in one church I was preaching evangelistically in some years back. And it was a really important principle as believers, we ought to fertilize one another. As believers, we ought to encourage one another. We ought to literally add fertilizer at the base of one another so that we're constantly helping one another to bear fruit. We're constantly helping one another to be fruitful and to be healthy. This is why I say uh, when somebody gets up in the church, you know, and they uh, sing their little heart out and they may not sing like, you know, Ethel Merman or, or they may sing like Ethel Merman. Uh, you know, we encourage them. We offer them encouragement. Oh, that was nice. Thank you. That was a blessing, you know. And, and you say things to encourage one another. Uh, the mistake some people make in churches is, uh, they love, they're constantly teasing and they're constantly saying things that are, have a little bit of a bite to them, you know. Well, you know, sister so-and-so, yeah, you sang and well, my ears didn't bleed anyway. Well, you're trying to be funny, but in the process of that, you have offered nothing that was positive or constructive or encouraging. So how about we just lay aside the foolishness and we simply speak words that are encouraging and positive. Do you follow what I'm saying? Don't go for that neutral garbage. Offer something that is encouraging. Offer something positive. Because as believers, one of the reasons we come to the house of God is because this is one of the one sanctuaries in the entire world where we can be built up and not torn down. Right. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Mm -hmm. This is where we come because we know we're all here with one another's best interests at heart. And we're all here to encourage one another. We're all here to support one another. We're all here to be here for one another. The Bible said, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So part of our job as a believer is when you're going through a tough time to help you carry that load. So we need to be mindful that we're not tearing down, but that we're always building up and offering fertilizer so that our neighbor, our fellow believer, can be fruitful and can be healthy. Paul said in verse 24, Galatians 5, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another that is the kind of foolishness that goes on in the world go to a drag show and see how many of those techie drag queens are going to sit there and pick each other apart and have, criticize one another. Oh, she didn't do this right. She didn't do that right. Me, 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 me. That should not be happening in the house of God. Shouldn't be about, well, sister smelts her, bless her heart. She sure couldn't carry a note in a bucket. Hallelujah, glory to God. Uh, she tried to get up there and sing, but she sure did sound like something, you know. No, 
Sister Smeltzer got up, bless her heart, and she sure put her heart into it. And she meant every word she sang. And just like that old lady on that video, I can listen to that old lady sing a million times a day. I love listening to her sing that song because all I see every time I hear her sing is somebody singing something she believes and believing it and rejoicing in it and getting happy over it. And that's all I see. I'm not paying attention whether her voice is cracking. I'm not paying attention whether or not she can sing well or sing poorly. That is a Pentecostal uh, trademark, to be honest with you. If you go back to the beginning of the Pentecostal movement, it was never about talent or ability. It was about anointing. God anoints people who are sincere and who are real. And boy, somebody get up to sing. It didn't matter if they sang well or sang poorly. If they sang from the heart, the Lord would anoint it and it would touch you and it would move you. Boy, I mean, I've seen people get up and, and sing. And I mean, from a, from a secular perspective, they couldn't sing their way out of a wet paper sack. But from a spiritual perspective, they were so sincere and so heartfelt. And boy, I mean, just give you chills listening to them. It just touched you in such a way listening to them. I remember in one church I belonged to in East Texas, we had a young man that came to church who was Down syndrome. And he'd get up every once in a while, he'd want to sing. And he'd get up to sing. And he'd sing, it's real, it's real. Praise God, I know it's real. The Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. It's real, it's real. Praise God, I know it's real. The Pentecostal blessing, and I know, I know it's real. It's mine, it's mine. Praise God, I know it's mine. The Holy Ghost and fire, and I know, I know it's mine. Do you know how many times we shouted all over that church with that little young man with Down syndrome singing in front of the church? Because we were judging it by a different standard. If you're going to live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Don't give in to the flesh. The flesh is going to criticize. The flesh is going to find fault. The flesh is going to look for things to pick on. Do you follow what I'm saying? But if we walk in the Spirit, we're looking at things from a different perspective. That little guy, bless his heart, he was, he was I say little guy, he was in his 30s. You know, but he was down syndrome. He had the mind probably of about a, Ten-year-old, you know. But when you're walking in the Spirit and you're following the leading of the Spirit, you approach things from a different perspective. You see things from a different perspective. Do you follow? Amen. Just like... Well, I'm, well, at least we're going to finish Galatians 5 tonight. I'm happy for that. Uh, there are so many things that I could point to as examples. You know, somebody comes to church and they're not quite dressed altogether appropriately. Maybe it's a young lady and she's got a lot more stuff showing than she necessarily needs to have showing, or a young man and he's got pants on so tight you can count his goosebumps, you know. And, uh, but when you walk in the spirit rather than in the flesh, it's amazing because a lot of times, you know, the Lord will help you, instead of criticizing and finding fault, the Lord will help you to understand the situation. Well, this person just started coming to church recently. They don't own any other genes. This young lady is a new convert, and she doesn't have any other clothes. If you're walking in the Spirit, then a lot of times what will happen is you'll see the situation, and the Spirit of the Lord will speak to you concerning a remedy rather than criticizing, condemning, finding fault, judging. The Spirit of the Lord will speak to you a remedy. Go buy her a dress. You know, offer to take her clothes shopping. Or, you know, whatever the case might be. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because, again, spiritual perspective is always going to approach things from a constructive place. We're not going to fall into envying one another. We're not going to fall into being jealous of one another. We're not going to be making one another angry. We're not going to be uh, creating mischief and creating problems in the church. And believe me, 
I've been pastoring a lot of years. I've, I've had people that did all of the above in churches that I've pastored. And uh, that's one reason why at the beginning of every one of our services, we start out with our meet and greet chorus. And every one of those choruses is in the same vein. You know, Lord, make us one. Unite us. Help us to love one another. We do that on purpose. That, that's not an accident that we do things that way. We do that on purpose because that is such an important thing for the church. Folks, I've been part of a lot of churches in my life that were anything but one. I've been part of a lot of churches in my life where we were anything but united and unified. I've been part of all kinds of churches where people looked at one another and were critical and were judgmental and were nasty and destructive. And I don't want to be part of a church like that. I don't ever want any church I pastor to look like that. I always want us to be able to look at one another through constructive eyes, through positive eyes. I want us always to look for opportunities to build one another up, not to tear one another down. And part of walking in liberty is making choices. They're choices. They're not, you're not responding to demands or edicts from God, but making choices in your life and in your lifestyle that are going to help encourage and inspire and support others, and at the same time, that are going to safeguard the weaker, that are going to be mindful of the weaker, those that don't have uh, the same spiritual stamina and the same spirituality that you have. You know, one of the things, and I'm closing on this point, one of the things that always cracks me up is when people want to brag about how spiritual they are. I had a guy on Facebook one day actually posted something uh, uh, I can't remember what my initial post was off the top of my head and and I said something to the effect of it had to do with something that somebody else had posted you know and oh I mean all kind of people jumped on them and started you know just jumping on them and criticizing them and and having something to say and I said you know I said I'm gonna reserve judgment on these people because I don't know what their experience has been. I don't know what uh, they've had to live through. I don't know, you know, what, what life has dealt out to them. And I just don't think it's constructive. I don't think it serves any good purpose to be jumping on them and, you know, criticizing them. And this guy come back to me, boy, let me know. Well, bless God, this is what he said. I'm not kidding. I'm at a place in my walk with God where I can sit in judgment of that. That's what he told me. I sat there and I thought, you've got to bloody be kidding me. <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. All at once you're trying to brag about your spirituality and at the same exact minute you're demonstrating you have none. I'm at the place in my walk with God where I can sit in judgment. And I'm like, really? Really? But that's the funny thing about the very people who will argue with half of what I'm teaching. I shouldn't have to adjust my lifestyle because of people in the church who maybe can't do things the way I can. If I'm spiritual enough to do those things, if I can have a drink without it bothering me, then it's on them to not drink because that's their issue. And while they're trying to tell me how spiritual they are, that they can do this without it affecting anybody else, or without it supposedly, you know, having to affect you, but they're demonstrating to me that they're missing the mark altogether, and they're not very spiritual at all. Because the spiritual person, a person who genuinely walks after the spirit and not after the flesh, is going to make choices that favor the spirit over the flesh every time. Well, but I enjoy a drink. Well, I'm sure I would too. I'm sure I'd like them, you know, as much as anybody would like them. But I don't have to do it. 
Martin, I've been going to parties my whole life and having nothing but Coca-Cola and Dr. Pepper and Sprite, and I have a blast. I have never one time in my life had to have a drink in order to have a good time. Not one time. I can honestly say, and anybody who knows me, y'all included, know that I can be a cut-up, and I can be a screwball, and I can be a goof, and I love to laugh, and I love to entertain. I don't need alcohol to have a good time. But I see ads every day on television that the only way to have a good, you know, tailgate party, you got to have Schlitz, or you got to have Budweiser, or you got to have whatever. I don't even know what brands are out there these days. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Liberty is about choices that we make because we see things from a spiritual perspective and we choose to do things that we believe we should do. It's not an issue of you only have two options. God says do this or, or don't do this. You know, No, it's not about do or don't. It's about I make choices because I'm following the leading of the Lord. I'm following the leadership of the Spirit of God. And my choices reflect my spirituality. They reflect my walk with God. The deeper, the more committed to the Lord people are, I'll be honest with you, the more godly a life they're going to live. Obviously, that only makes sense. That's one reason why I love to be in a church that has a bunch of old-time believers that have been walking in this thing for 40 or 50 years. Because I'm going to tell you, those people are a blessing. Because, especially it's a lot of our old-time Pentecostal, I'm telling you, they're a blessing just to be in the room with them. Because their walk with God is so sweet and it's so sincere. And it, they've been doing this now for so many years, Martin. And their spirituality is reflected in how they carry themselves and how they live their lives. The older you get, the better you're going to get. The longer you walk with the Lord, the better your walk with God is going to get. Trust me, it works like that. We start out as born-again believers, as babes. But every baby grows up. So eventually we'll get better. Eventually we'll, our spirituality will grow and we'll become uh, better at what we're doing. We'll become better at following the leadership of the Lord. We'll get better at manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. It's just the natural process of walking with God. Would you stand with me tonight? Amen.